Good morning, church. It's really good for me to be here with you. My name is Joseph Chiang, and I serve with the Youth of the Mission Singapore. The last time when I was with you, uh, you guys were still meeting at the Amokyo Hub. At that time, it was Reverend Stanley Chua. And so this is a, really a privilege and a blessing for me to be here in your sanctuary. But actually, you are not here. I'm here. And uh, I'll be with you for the next two Sundays. And I'll be speaking on the topic called the Hospitable God. Uh, I thought I'd like to share with you a story. At the end of every year, I have a habit of turning to the Lord and asking Him what I see in store for us for the following year. In the year 2019, it was sometime in October when I started praying towards the year 2020. Now, because 2020 also represents a perfect vision, clarity. So I thought it was going to be about clarity, a clarity of a vision, a clarity of a direction as a nation and for me as an individual person. And when I sought the Lord about it, He gave me one word and the word was called reset. Reset. So I put these two words together, together clarity and reset. All right, I can understand that. It's about having a resetting of how I see things and that I can see things clearer. Towards the end of the year, in the month of December, I felt the Lord gave me a scripture from Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. It says here, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I was a bit taken aback. What would God be doing that even if He had told me, I wouldn't believe in it? Well, when January hit and we hear about COVID that happened in other countries. When it arrived to our Singapore shows, I still thought it was just going to be a passing phase. I was traveling at that point in time. In fact, I traveled up to the first week of March, just before Singapore locked down. By the time it hit sometime in end of March and early April, I begin to realize that this is something that is global and that God has pressed a reset button in all the nations of the world and in there, God is trying to adjust something. God is trying to reset something in the world and calibrate the whole world to His desire and His purpose. So I begin to sort the Lord and I say, God, how are we going to survive this global pandemic? And he gave me a word from Psalms 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. And the focus is the word, unless the Lord. And it seems to me that God is really wanting His leadership. God is wanting His kingship over us and over the nations. And I really felt that, that this reset is a time for the great reset first in the church. God wants to reset the church. As I begin to sit down and wait on God and just begin to listen to Him and wondering, what is God wanting to reset? Well, at least for us here in Singapore, what is His desire for us in the Singapore church here. And I felt the Lord said that He wanted to reset us to become a missional church, to return to be a missional church. Now, the missional church is a representation of the incarnation of Jesus. Number one, it is a community of disciples committed to know God and to reveal Him, the character of God, to the nations, to the last, to the least, and to the lost. It is not about doing more. Rather, it's about knowing God better and deeper in an increasing measure so that the church can rightly represent Him accurately to the community surrounding us. Number two, it is a community that's filled with the compassion and the generosity of Christ. It is to reach and to transform its community. Compassion and generosity is a forethought and not an afterthought. Compassion and generosity is a forethought. It's something that's right in front of us. It's not something that we suddenly realize later on. And number three, it is a community that embraces both local and global missions. And I feel that God is really trying to adjust the church to pay attention to our neighbors, to pay attention to what is right in front of us as He is taking us also into the nations in there. So I have a scripture here from Isaiah 65 verse 1. Maybe we can all read it together. Ready? Go. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, 
here am I, here am I. Now, most of us here, we are quite familiar with the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord and Isaiah saw the glory of God when he heard God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah says, Here I am, Lord, send me. But this is the tail end of the book of Isaiah. And the tail end of the book of Isaiah, it is God himself that's saying this. I am a proactive God and I long to be reviewed and I long to be known and I do not wait for people to call on me. I don't wait for anyone to call on me. I will be proactive. I will want to review myself even before anyone calls on my name. And here am I, here am I. I believe that God is calling the global church, especially Singapore church, to really know God deeper and in an increasing measure in our lives. That we don't just know Him in our heads, but we know Him in our hearts. I'd like to show you a chart. This table is my own quiet time. It has been my own Christian journey in how I know God. On the left-hand column is a role of God's nature. In there, it talks about who God is that we can never be. This is an aspect that belongs to God and God alone, and He shares it with no one else. God is invisible. He has not given us the gift to be invisible. God is uh, 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 all able, all knowing, all present. We can't do that. And that belongs to God and God alone. When God reveals that part of who He is, our response is reverence. We bow down and worship Him for who He is. The middle column is God's character. This is the column that God says, be like me. So when we say to be like Christ, we're talking about the middle column. And the whole list of middle column is meant to be experienced. Not meant to be known in our heads, but meant to be known in our hearts. But you see, when we look at the character of God, every part of God's character has an expression. God will always be, and out of His being, He will do. Hence, the middle column and the right-hand column are two sides of the same coin. It is when God says, this is me, and this is what I do. This is me, and this is what I do. So as the church as he invites us into a deeper understanding and the knowledge of who he is, he's saying, know me, and as you know me, you will learn how to do. You will learn how to become me in a very tangible way, in a very practical way. Now, the early church was a missional church. And when we look into the scriptures in Acts chapter 2, we read about the, uh, the Pentecost Sunday, the Pentecost whereby the Holy Spirit came and fell on the 120, and out of that, 3,000 people were added to the kingdom of God. And then Acts 2 verse 42 says this to us, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, what is this day? This day is that 3,000 plus 120, right? Now, we've got to understand that the 3,000 was not a monoculture people. They came from all parts of the world, gathered together in Jerusalem to celebrate the national festival. So this word day was an international community. It was a cross-cultural community that was committed together to know God and they became the early church. Now they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Watch this. They came together and they did four things. Apostles teaching, fellowship, hanging out with one another, breaking of bread, and prayer. Then, they were experiencing signs and wonders as they do these four things. The signs and wonders happen out of the times of fellowship and out of the times of going out to the streets and whatever they were doing, they were experiencing signs and wonders. But as more and more people became Christians and became followers of Jesus, they noticed that there were people that were very poor people that were marginalized and people that no one looked after. You must remember, at that point in time, the welfare of the city, the welfare of the community was not taken care of by the government. It was taken care of by the church. The church carried the welfare of the society. And how did the church did it? They saw the people that had need. And then as they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, they begin to realize, if I have 
I must share with those who don't have. If I have property, then I must sell my property so that those who don't have can be blessed. They elevate poverty in the society. That was how powerful the early church was. It wasn't just the signs and wonders bit. That was a huge part. But the bigger part was how they elevate poverty in the society. Mm-hmm. They broke bread. They met together in the temple courts daily. And then from the temple courts, they would go to their homes and they would break bread in their homes and ate together. Now, you've got to understand that at the point in time, breaking bread together means having a meal together. So what did they do? They were worshipping at the temple courts, corporate gatherings. But as they were leaving the temple courts, they will meet strangers along the streets. Then they will invite those strangers to come to the house. And they will, they will break bread together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the scripture says, the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. The early church did not do evangelism, but as a strategy or as a department. The early church did evangelism out of their lifestyle by welcoming strangers into their homes. That was what happened. We read now in Acts chapter 4, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possession was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who own land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the scripture. They talk about how the early church elevated poverty from the society. Within 25 years, from the day of the Pentecost, the gospel traveled 3,600 miles from Jerusalem and reached to more than 1 million people. The success story of this multiplication is due to a people movement, centrally led by the Holy Spirit and a complete obedience to the teachings of Christ. So my question is this. Scripture tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What were the apostles' teaching? I believe with all of my heart that they were teaching on the life and the teachings of Christ because that would be something that's most fresh in the head. There are three years of journeying together with Christ, and especially the last conversation that Christ had with them at the Lord's Supper, which is a main chunk. We read about that in John chapter 13 all the way through to 16. It's a huge chunk of his conversation with his disciples. And the Lord and the disciples, the early church, would have taken that last chunk and to tell the people about who Christ was and what it means. And one of the things that you and I need to know, that the early church would not call Christians. They were called the followers of the way. It's so mouthful, isn't it? The followers of the way. What do you believe in? Oh, I'm a follower of the way. So the pre-believing will ask this question. What is this way? They will say, the way is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Then the pre-believing will ask, show us the way. Then they will say this. Oh, but Jesus is right now in heaven. Then how will we know the way? The early church will say this. Look at us. When you see us, you will know the way. You see, the early church was the incarnational Jesus to the community in there. Therefore, one of the strongest words that they would have taught is John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, when it says, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the early church took this word literally. To love someone is to be able to serve and to help someone is a practical thing that I must do and translate it into my daily lives in there. Radical generosity to those within and outside the church was the modus operandi of the early church. Radical generosity. They were so radical in how generous they were to the people surrounding And I truly believe that one of the teachings that they would have given to the early church is this particular one here that says the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan focuses on this one word called neighbor. Neighbor. Who is my neighbor? I'd like to draw your attention to the time whereby Jesus 
illustrated and talked about the great commandment with regards to this word called neighbor. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. I assume everybody nodded their head and said, hmm, that's correct. But Jesus also said this, this is the greatest and the foremost commandment. The second is like it. I'm very sure at that point in time, everybody is thinking, what is this second? And Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophet. In another translation, it says this, on these two commandments hangs the entire law and the prophets. Now, wait a minute. As we think back in the Old Testament, where did these two commandments come from? Now, we are familiar, all the Jewish community is familiar, are familiar with the greatest commandment that is taken from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 5. But it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. Every Jew knows that this is the greatest commandment. But where on earth did the second one come from? Well, if we look into the scriptures, there isn't actually a second one. In fact, Jesus pulled out a passage from the book of Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 to 18. This is what it says. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very ages of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. In this part, he's saying this. In your salary, in your monthly income and salary, sell apart a portion for those who are in need. That's the summary of that first part. Next, do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your neighbor. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so that you will not share in the guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, Jesus pulled out a line within the passage and he stick it to Deuteronomy 6. What Jesus is saying this is this. Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 are two sides of one coin. You cannot say, I love God, but I do not love my neighbor. So when we look into this part of it, when it says in Matthew 22, the second is like it, meaning the second is just as great as the first. Hence, you cannot say that I love God, but I don't love this person. I don't let them love that person. It does not work in Christianity. So as we look into the parable of the Good Samaritan, we're going to look at this passage, all right? Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you have answered correctly, said Jesus. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Notice the word he used. Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus told a story. 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Watch this. It's from Jerusalem to Jericho, not from Jericho to Jerusalem. Right? When he was attacked by the robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, meaning from Jerusalem to Jericho, meaning the priest had finished his, his priestly duties, had done his religious duties, and he was on his way to Jericho to go home. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Watch this passage. The priest and the Levite, they were on their way home. They walked past this man. They saw the man, both of them. They saw the man after worship. They saw the man and they choose to walk away. Why? Because they do not know the guy. He was a stranger. He's not my neighbor. And because I do not know him, he's not my neighbor, I'm not obliged to help him. I'm not obliged to help this guy because I do not know this guy. Whereas Jesus used the Samaritan guy, when he saw him, he took pity on him and he did the act of neighboring towards him. Watch what Jesus said. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? You realize how Jesus used the word neighbor? The lawyer says, who is my neighbor? Jesus asked, which of the three was a neighbor to the man? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Watch this. Which is a noun and which is a verb? How did the lawyer use the word? He uses the word, who is my neighbor? That is the noun. But Jesus flip it around and he says this, neighbor is not a noun. But in biblical thinking, neighbor is an action word. Who can I be a neighbor to? Who can I be merciful to? Who can I show compassion to? So Jesus put the ownership on us. It's not about whether you know the guy. The question is, will you be a neighbor to the guy? Will you be a neighbor to someone else in there? Biblical thinking of the word neighbor is an action word. Therefore, the question is not, who is my neighbor, but rather, who can I be a neighbor to? Loving our neighbor can be a very, very inconvenient thing to do. In Joy Piper's message in April 1995, he preached his message on the overwhelming command to love, to neighboring love. He says this, I say that it is overwhelming because it seems to demand that I tear the skin off my body and wrap it around another person so that I feel that I am that other person. All the longings that I have for my safety, my health, my success and happiness, I now feel for that person as though he were me. Wow. That was how John Piper described what neighboring love is all about. Brothers and sisters, can I say this to us? Loving our neighbor is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. It is a commandment just as important as it means to love God. At least this is how Jesus had presented it. So how did the early church transform the cities, especially during the pandemic? This global pandemic is not new. It happened in our history before. During the plague periods in the Roman Empire, Christians made a name for themselves. Historians have suggested that the terrible Antonin plague of the second century, which might have killed off a quarter of the Roman Empire, led to the spread of Christianity. As Christians cared for the sick and offered a spiritual model, whereby plagues were not the work of an angry 
and, and, and caparous deities, but the product of a broken creation in revolt against a loving God. But the more famous pandemic is the plague of the Cyprian, named for a bishop, probably a disease related to Ebola. The plague of Cyprian helped set off the crisis of the third century in the Roman world, but it did something else. It triggered the explosive growth of Christianity. Cyprian's sermons told Christians not to grieve for the plague victims who live in heaven, but to redouble the efforts to care for the living. His fellow bishop, Dionysus, described how Christians, heedless of danger, took charge of the sick and attending to their every need. A century later, the actively pagan emperor Julian complained bitterly of how the Galileans would care for even non-Christian sick people. When the church historian Pontius recounted how Christians ensured that good was done to all men, not only to the household of faith. This habit of sacrificial care has reappeared throughout all history. In 1527, when the bubonic plague hit Wurttemberg, Martin Luther refused calls to flee the city and to protect himself. Rather, he stayed in the city and ministered to the sick. The refusal to run away cost his daughter Elizabeth her life by produce a tract, whether Christians should flee the plague. When Luther provided a clear articulation of the Christian and ep epidemic response, we die at our post. Christian doctors cannot abandon the hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee the districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregation. That was how the early church impacted the whole world through the pandemic. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that this global pandemic has created for us an opportunity and not a prison? It really depends on how the church looks at this situation. We either spend all our time just thinking about how do we self-preserve, self-protect, and set up all the things to protect ourselves, or in our COVID task force, we add in the task force a COVID outreach force because we believe that this time is the greatest opportunity to share the love of God in the most practical and tangible way. The church, you have to decide, is this pandemic locking you and I in as a prison or does it create an opportunity for us to do whatever God wants to do? So as we look into this, we begin to uncover as, as Amokyo Methodist Church Look at this year's theme called A Home with a Heart. In closing, I have three questions for you. Amokyo Methodist Church's vision for 2021 is home with a heart. How does this look like in your cell groups, in your personal lives, especially during this pandemic season? What impacted you in this morning's sermon and why? Number three, who can you be enabled to? Who? can you be a neighbor to in this coming week, in this coming month? Who can you reveal God's love in the most practical and tangible way? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have saved us by your love and by your mercy. Thank you, God, that you did not wait for us to call upon you. You came and sought after us. And that was how, God, we came to the saving knowledge of who you are. And look at the church in Singapore today. You have blessed us with so much. I often wonder if the early church members came to Singapore church today, what would they say? How would they respond looking at what we have in our church today? I pray God that our wealth and our blessings will not lock us in but rather it will free us to take all the resources that you have blessed us with to be like the early church, to share it amongst those who are lost, who are needy, and who are marginalized. Love with no strings attachment. Help us, God. Convict our hearts, O oh God, 
to allow you to reset our lives, to allow you to reset Amokyo Methodist Church. In Jesus' name, amen.